So now we're going to be beginning chapter four. And in this chapter, you're going to learn how neural communication occurs between two neurons. So they started looking at how neurons communicate using electrical stimulation. And this really shed light on some of the initial of the initial concepts that needed to be understood uh, so that scientists could better understand how information travels via neurons. Let's take a step back and revisit a little bit of maybe high school physics. So if you have an electrical stimulation, current leaves the stimulator through a wire lead. And in this case, this is the red right here. And that attaches to an electrode right here. And from this uninsulated tip of the electrode, the current enters the tissue and stimulates it right in here. And the current flows back to the stimulator through a second lead connected to the reference electrode. So humans, we have the capacity to collect or conduct electricity. Okay, so this is one of the principal things that, of course, if we get struck by lightning, then uh, the electricity travels through us to the ground, okay? And so our tissue has the potential to conduct electricity. And they would notice that if you hooked up a nerve, then you would be able to see the amount of electricity that went through and passed down the nerve, and then it would basically be um, measured at this end tip, okay? So if you, you can deliver a range of two to 10 millivolts intensity sufficient to produce a response, and that does not damage the cell. So if you have too much electricity, such as a bolt of lightning, then you're gonna damage the cell. But a little bit is not going to damage us. If we were to have a little um, shock that we would get from static electricity or something like that, uh, that is going to be more than uh, what our nerves would encounter. Uh, these electrical recordings can occur where you look at the difference in voltage between the tip here and the tip here, okay? So this indicates how much voltage passes. Okay, so there were a couple of early clues that linked electricity and neural activity because you can imagine from early scientists, early lay people, uh, that one, they didn't necessarily think about the stuff, but when they were trying to, they wouldn't really connect electricity with communication within their own body. So von Helmholtz in the 19th century, he was one of the first scientists to investigate the flow of information in the nervous system. And what he found was that this flow of information in the nervous system was too slow to be the flow of electricity. Nerve conduction is about 30 to 40 meters per second, whereas electricity is three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. So electricity travels much, much faster. So that was something that was curious with regards to, well, electrical electricity is involved, but how is it actually occurring? So what was deduced by Bernstein in 1886 was that it is not the charge, but the wave that travels along an axon. And so let me explain a little bit more about what that means, okay? So neurons can convey information as a wave induced by stimulation on the cell body, cell body traveling down the axon terminal. So if we look here, you're going to have some signal that is going to come in. And this signal, once it reaches the axon hillock, then it will begin an action potential. And you'll be learning about this more in the next subsequent chapters. So this action potential, this um, electrical wave, uh, once it hits the axon hillock, then it starts to travel down the length of the axon. And you can see here. And then once here it reaches this voltmeter, then it measures the, uh, the electrical charge. And then the action potential continues down to the end, the terminal button, the end of the axon, and will then communicate with the next neuron. 
So a voltmeter can detect the passage of the wave. So one of the ways that they first started to show this wave propagation was by looking at very large axons. So most of the axons in the human body are quite thin and quite small. And so we will have form a nerve by a collection of axons. Well, there's other animals that have much larger axons that can be used uh, for measurement purposes with, with much greater ease. So the giant axon of the squid is a good example for this. So <clears throat> the giant axon of the squid was used by Hodkin and Huxley in the 1930s and 1940s. And they could try to stimulate the cell and they would then measure how long it took for this information to propagate down uh, the axon. And the way they measured this is that they would have um, microelectrodes. They'd have a set of small electrodes, small enough to place on or into the axon. And again, you can get an idea then of how difficult this would be with uh, a human axon because it's so tiny that you wouldn't be able to have a glass tip that would be small enough to uh, to have it function correctly, especially at the time that, that this was occurring sort of in early uh, scientific endeavors. Um, they did not have the technology that we have now. So what they would do is they would have an uninsulated wire tip that would go directly in some sort of stimulation to stimulate or record or they would have a conducting fluid, so sort of small tip of glass, and the wire would sit in a fluid within this glass. So this would be such a salt water that could, that could conduct electricity quite well. So this would be right in here. And uh, they would put this uh, microelectrode on the cell body so they could provide stimulation here. So they could try to say, okay, we're gonna get this neuron to fire. And what they would do then is they would put it right up here and they could through um, rudimentary batteries, they could basically provide a little shock that would then begin this neural propagation. So they could deliver an electrical current to a single neuron. So in delivering this electrical current to a single neuron, they could start the action potential right down here and then measure how long it took to get to the end of the squid's axon. A couple of really important ions that are necessary for this electrical wave to travel down the axon. And so we're going to talk more about those, but I have to fill you guys in on some of the basic terminology so that you can start to understand this next section of the chapter. So we have cautions and anions, okay? Uh, cautions are positively charged ions, and sodium and potassium are examples of this. So here you have sodium, and here you have potassium. Anions, negatively charged ions, this is chloride. And then you're also going to have protein molecules. So to maintain the resting potential of a cell, you have a balance, particularly from sodium and potassium. And one of the ways that they do this is they balance then how these flow in and out of the cell. So here inside there are inside the cell there are a number of fixed anions. So these are protein molecules that are always inside the cell that are part of uh, cellular function and they have a negative charge. So they maintain this negative charge within the cell. And then you're also going to have chlorine inside the cell, which they don't, which they don't have here. So in the next video, you're going to learn more about how these cautions, um, basically how on the whole ions, travel across the membrane to propagate electrical activity and to propagate neural communication.